Okay, Steve Mann. Hello, um, maybe you can switch to my video here. You can switch to my signal. Um, I'm talking about uh, this invention, uh, wearable computer invention with the computer controlled laser light source in the eyeglass frames that shines into my eye and causes the eye itself to function as, as if it were a cam both a camera and a display. Um, I wonder if we can switch that to VGA so that, uh, like it was before, is there a back? Oh, there it is. Um, so this is what's going into my left eye. Steve, move the chair, roll the chair out. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea, actually. You can slide this chair back. All right, so uh, what I've got here is a computer-controlled laser light source shining into my left eye, and the computer controls the laser beam and, and provides a, what, what I refer to as an ITAP technology. And so what that means is that I have this X-Windows system going into my eye. This is a, a computer running the GNU Linux operating system and uh, providing a web server and a web browser and various other utilities, so it's sort of typical. A compute server, and so uh, I get the the signal from my eye, and of course I can have slightly different uh, uh, different um, versions of reality. So I've got various windows here on the computer, and I can go around from one window to the next. And these are all just simple X386 windows, and um, so one of the things, of course, we can have creative, artistic views of the world as I see the world, for example, in, in ASCII art and uh, the nostalgic view of the world. <laughs> and I think of that as sort of the, the early days of history. And I have a web browser here that we wrote at, at my, my lab. It's, it's called the, the Glynx web browser. And uh, so I'm going to visit this web page, which is on my body here, notice you can see all the icons around the top here, all the flashing logos and everything. But actually, uh, we got rid of those, so there's no icons or, or menus or anything. It's just a very simple web browser. And this is the title of my talk. And so I'm going to talk just briefly and quickly about an historical overview of, of, of WearComp and the wearable computer system. And so the origins of this thing, looking back 20 years or so when I first built some of these uh, things here, this, this is wearable computer thing was invented here in Canada 20 years ago or more actually back in the 70s. And what I was looking at was visual output and some kind of, of switches to control it and everything. And I was sort of exploring this kind of cybernetic photography. And so these are some examples of cybernetic photographs taken using this apparatus, or, or one similar to it. And so the, 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 by the late 1970s, I was experimenting with these sort of computer-mediated experiences and altering my perception of reality by the machine. And by allowing others to alter my visual perception of reality, I invented a new communications medium. Now. Uh, Further down the road, sort of looking back into the 80s, this by the 1980s, this involved, evolved back in 1981 into a general purpose computer system that uh, involved uh, sort of what you might call now a multimedia computer system, except that it was attached to the body and ran off a battery. And I remember back then when people asked me what this thing was, and I said it was a computer, they asked me, where is it plugged in? And I said, it isn't plugged in. It runs on a battery. And they said, I don't believe you. People just couldn't believe that a computer would run on a battery. And so I showed them, you know, and they said, wow, that's really neat. And, uh, uh, you know, this was sort of before the era of these laptop computers and everything like that. So at the time, what this multimedia computer running into my eye uh, on a battery-operated backpack-based rig was a, was a kind of new concept uh, that De departed significantly from the ideas of desktop metaphor and, and traditional 
uh, laptop computer style thinking that we still see now. The laptop computer is just a reinstantiation of the desktop. You still have to be seated while you're using it. It's not much different really. It's not really a paradigm shift over the desktop computer. So what I was interested in doing, this, this early system uh, that I had, so if we look, uh, was kind of cumbersome obviously. <laughs> And this I developed as a tool for visual arts, for visual artists. And the whole notion here is that it's a row of lights that are sequenced by the computer in a photographic space. And sort of I lived in a photographic world. The, the, the metaphor, Isherwood's metaphor, I am a camera, was not a metaphor for me. And of course, uh, being uh, in, in this really s space, and I had back then, I had a similar thing in my left hand or right hand. Uh, with a bunch of switches on it, which I could type in commands to the computer by clicking away at different combinations of the switches. Just like you'd play a guitar or something by pushing down different combinations of strings, you can get different symbols or chords. And then that light uh, <coughs> push broom, of course, can create patterns in the air photographically over long exposure pictures and print out messages and graphics and text, as well as create uh, creative lighting effects and that sort of thing. So this was sort of the era of cybernetic photography and the idea of using mediated reality with these wearable computers to, as a form of collaboration in the production of visual art. And then back more, more recently, and so some of the things I did then with the, the blind vision, a system to help the visually challenged and so on. And then uh, back in the, in the 1990s, uh, 1991, I brought this invention down to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and started a kind of project there. And uh, everybody had told me that that's the place to go if you're kind of geeky. So people, <laughs> back in the 70s here in Canada, people walked across the street to avoid me and sort of thought this was kind of crazy. And everybody said, if you go down to MIT, everybody will just love it and people will totally accept you. So I went down there and of course, people still thought I was crazy and people... <laughs> Back in 1991, people still asked me what planet I was from and I thought, I, don't, I wouldn't expect that from a place that's sort of supposed to be technologically oriented. But um, after a few years there, I think uh, it kind of settled in. And when I started getting some outside recognition from the IEEE Computer Society, who asked me to write a white paper on this invention and, and so on. Originally, I had a lot of opposition from within MIT. But I think once I got outside recognition and outside validation, uh, these barriers sort of broke down. And it sort of started a, a project there. Um, I'll just play a video here that shows this project. And there's also a little excerpt from my documentary video, Shooting Back, uh, in which I used the apparatus to create this video. So um, I'll play that. Uh, I'll play this, this short little segment about uh, the starting of the MIT project. And then that follows with a documentary that I made with a covert version of this apparatus. Because over the years, I kept making it smaller and smaller until finally I built one system that just looks like ordinary eyeglasses and was a covert system. And, and that system um, I had uh, concealed in, in what looked like ordinary glasses. And I went around making a documentary about making a documentary about video surveillance. So I went around. <laughs> I went around to various places where cameras are, are used, ex where surveillance is used extensively, where, but where they get upset when you bring in your own video camera. So I'll just play that now. I wonder if we can switch to NTSC. Can we switch that to NTSC? The big screen there? Totally different. It's, 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 it's a very, very different time for us. Steve Mann was uh, building wearable computers in high school. And I think it's it's perfectly good example that here's a young man that brought with him an idea that was very much on the lunatic fringe, was very much something that people thought, well, this is kind of weird and it doesn't really make sense. And when he arrived here, a lot of people sort of said, wow, this is very interesting. And faculty became more interested. And he, and it's a, I think it's probably one of the best examples we have of where somebody brought with them an extraordinarily interesting seed. And then sort of, now that 
so-called cyborgs in the media lab and the people working on wearable computers all over the place. What I've got is I've got a computer screen in my glasses. I've been experimenting with uh, something, uh, what you might call um, wearable computing or person, you know, personal computing. The real thing here is that it replaces a lot of the normal things that we carry, such as camcorder, uh, still camera, um, Walkman, um, pager, cell phone, all of those personal electronics items are subsumed into a single apparatus because, you know, I have a camera built into the glasses so that as I look around, the algorithm that I've developed seamlessly stitches multiple pictures together and makes them into an image composite, something I call painting with looks. And here's my documentary video, our little excerpt. Oh, is that, can you, can we keep that going? So this and this one I've got my right eye tapped. Is that a camera up there? Yeah. Um, what what's it for? Security. Oh yeah, is it taking pictures of me or Yeah. Is it? Wouldn't that make customers feel uncomfortable? No. For security. You don't think a camera would make somebody feel uncomfortable, maybe? No. Sort of like nobody asked me permission if they could take my picture. It's sort of just well, done. It's, uh, it's my, it's, uh, the bis I don't know about that. It's, for security reasons, you come into a business place, we have to protect ourselves. I don't know how that, that can be handled. What do you think? Ask. Yeah. You come into the store, you have to ask. Oh, yeah. What I'm saying is, I don't Hi. think there's any legal premise that we have to ask That's for us to put a security camera in this door. I don't. That's a personal one. That's not a security one. Mm -hmm. So you can't do that, and you can't even take pictures in the store. See, how do you, you know? How do you feel? Doesn't it make you feel uncomfortable? No, I do not. But the thing is, it's the rule. You don't take pictures in the store. Why not? It's a, it's a store rule. For my own personal protection. No. Nope. No, because this is the business. You can't do that. You can be sent out of the store for that. Just to protect myself. But doesn't it make you what feel you uncomfortable? Protect yourself. You're coming to a business. You're protecting <laughs> Have you been here before? So what's happening here is I've got an ordinary handy cam in my right hand that I'm holding up to my eye. But it's just a prop, really, because the real camera is my right eye itself. So if you look carefully here, you'll see the eye cup, the eyepiece is coming up to my right eye, and you're inside my right eye, and now you're looking inside the viewfinder of the Handycam. So it's a documentary about making a documentary about video surveillance. Yeah, I was just wondering, what are those those uh, dark uh, things up on the ceiling? All oh, those? That's just the AC system. Just the what? AC system. Oh yeah, like those dark hemispheres up up, up on the ceiling. Yeah. Is what's a, what do you mean by AC? They're just the temperature. Oh, they're what? Like temperature sensors? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. For air conditioning or heating? Both. Yeah, I was just wondering um, what the dark uh, thing up on the ceiling is okay, there. I don't know. I have no idea. Hmm. Is it some kind of camera, maybe? It could be. I don't know, sir. I just answered your question. I do not know. Not sure what it is. Is I'm there somebody? Sure what it is. is there somebody who might know what it is? Uh, security people. If you want to go down here as far as you can go, you can sit, talk to the security people. Oh yeah. So it has something to do with security. I don't know, sir. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to put words in my mouth. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering what that that uh, dark thing up on the ceiling is there. Those are cameras from security watching people. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Would what, don't you find they make customers feel uncomfortable though? No. Well, actually, they probably make most people feel comfortable because they know. Feel safe. Yeah. Why is that? Because they're watching over you. If somebody's next to you with a gun or stealing, they'll know it. You. Yeah, but there might be some people who are camera shy or... or well, they're in the, 
around Unfortunately, the, the, the world that we live in today, you, you can't trust everybody. By them having security and stopping crime and criminals and stealing keeps the prices down. Yeah, so it's, it's a matter of difficult to trust people, I guess. In yeah, that's the world we live in. It's just it's unfortunate, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. It says, like, the story you can trust. Um, but yet it's sort of, isn't it ironic that there isn't sort of mutual trust? Is that how the world is? Especially right. like, when you have presidents and first ladies making crime. Yeah. Then, you know, I guess anyone can be anybody. a criminal. Don't let the balls bother you. They're not. But you don't think that cameras might make people feel uncomfortable? No, 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 don't do that. So we can switch back to, to VGA here. Um, so the, the thing about shooting back, I think, that was really interesting was that it, I've got people telling me that only criminals are afraid of cameras. And then when I pull the handycam out of my satchel and point it at somebody, you know, the same people who called me a, a criminal or called me paranoid, or we end up, we, we're sort of holding a mirror up to society. It's the toaster calling the kettle chrome. And, and by holding a mirror up to society, we kind of really see it. It really says something true and interesting about society. I think that the, the, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been hidden by the answers. And so the whole idea of bringing about this change in the way in, in electronic news gathering, what the ITAP technology, by tapping directly into my right eye, this is my left eye here in this machine, but the other one was my right eye because most handicams are right-handed, so I transmitted my right eye to my website. By tapping right into my right eye, um, just like you tap a telephone, you get you know you get both sides of the conversation. You you, you get a certain inner uh, truth or whatever. There's a certain uh, interesting kind of element to that because it's bring it brought the audience right inside my head. This is back in 1994 when I was putting myself on the web, transmitting my everyday life all the time, continuously transmitting to my website and changing the way electronic news gathering is done because interesting events would happen. There was a fire uh, at the East Campus and I, I, I happened to witness that and got lots of pictures of it and then when I I called up the newspaper and I asked them if they had been able to get their photographers out to cover that event and they said they desperately wanted to get their photographers out but they couldn't get in touch with anyone. So then, of course, I told them that I've got a few thousand pictures of that event and asked them if they wanted to get that. So now that I'm back here in Canada, this, this, uh, it's funny because I invented this thing in Canada more than 20 years ago. I took it down to the United States and then now I'm back here in Canada again, and now I'm, I'm teaching a course on personal cybernetics. Um, and we've got this sort of community of cyborgs, so this is sort of my teaching. This is my, co this is my covert version of the apparatus with the hollow frame eyeglasses and the laser. Instead of sticking up here with duct tape, I actually had it inside running along, uh, along the frames so that it was completely covert. And then I've got... Uh, class here I'm teaching and I, I give each of the students one of these systems here which is is sort of a cruder form of the technology but it's nevertheless a kind of um, uh, simple em embodiment so so ideally for news gathering we'd like something like this is, is another covert apparatus that I built for it's a, a wearable wireless webcam system and uh, so this is another one of the news gathering systems but before we can build these covert systems, we need first to understand how they work and everything. So what, I, what I've been doing is I've been teaching, um, one of the things is teaching Engware how to build these ITAP devices. This is a, a picture of the ITAP device and what it looks like, uh, just the regular ITAP, obviously not covert. Um, this, is, this is an unretouched photograph of how it looks if you just look in to the tapped eye and, and, and see. Maybe James Fung, do you want to come up and, and show? Um, is one of my students here who's built, uh, so I, I coach each of the students through building a very simple version of the electronic news gathering system like this. And if we look, uh, what, what we have here is if, if, you face, if you face the audience here, in fact, maybe what I should do is I should uh, show the audience what this looks like on the, on the screen here. If I look into your eye here, 
if I look into his eye, what I see is his left eye is a camera. So eye is a camera. Isherwood's metaphor is actually true because the eye itself is the camera. His left eye is the camera. And in fact, if you look at uh, from a side view here, um, if I go back to here and then go back to the web the Glynx web browser, we can see a side view of that apparatus. I should go to. We can see a side view of that thing, and I'll go right down to the bottom here. And then from the side, it looks, you've got that Aramac at the top, and you can see here that there's the camera at the bottom. So if you look at the side, light rays of light that would otherwise enter his left eye are diverted through this camera, and rays of light that would otherwise pass through the center of projection of his left eye instead pass through the center of projection of this camera and are transmitted to the internet. Then back, coming back from the internet, rays of light are reconstituted and reconstructed at the top, shining down and emerge, going into his left eye to replace the rays of light that would have otherwise entered his left eye. So the apparatus is very simple to see when it's in large scale like that. And it's, it's better for teaching purposes, actually, to have a large unit that the students can actually get in there and understand. And so the idea of this very simple apparatus is to turn the eye itself into a camera and put the eye on the internet. Now this, uh, just as when you tap a telephone, you hear both sides of the conversation, you also, when you tap the eye, you get both sides of the eye. So you get, you tap into and out of my left eye or right eye or both eyes, and you tap the eye and uh, rays of light that would come in um, are, are diverted and, and, and out to the internet. So, but also people can write on my retina with the laser. The laser's controlled by a computer and the computer's on the internet. So when I'm at the grocery store and I reach out for that, that uh, homo milk, I can see an X on it because my wife from home is looking <laughs> out through my eyes. <laughs> and of course she can scribble on my retina with the laser. So when I reach for that 1% that health, that homo milk, I see an X on it and a little arrow with a circle around the other milk. <laughs> so what I in fact get is, is an altered perception of reality that's on the internet. So uh, when I'm doing electronic news gathering, of course I'm teleprompted. I've got a covert apparatus that teleprompts me and uh, the person, so I have a remote, I can have a remote panel of experts uh, who are prompting me, and I can I can sort of have essentially uh, infinite bandwidth in a sense, and in terms of legal advice, if I'm if I'm talking, it can be a, a Roger and me style documentary. Shooting back was a Roger and me style documentary with no Roger, because I would talk to the the clerk, and the clerk would say the manager put the cameras there. I talk to the manager, the manager says the directive come from head office. Head office says the insurance companies require it, and on and on and on. So it's great to have a few lawyers on my board. So I can have a board of directors remotely op teleoperating my body, and I can, of course, see. Of course, I've also got the, I can also put electrodes on my body so it can be remotely driven like a radio controlled car while viewing out my left or right eye. So it can get quite interesting in terms of, of a creative space, and there's certainly a notion of electronic news gathering. I don't know if I should maybe take a, a moment and, and, and entertain a couple of questions, maybe, or? No questions. So, uh, how much time have I got? Two minutes. Three minutes. Maybe I'll just have that juice here. So anyway, the interesting thing, <laughs> I got two minutes, and um, what I'd like to sort of say in closing is I think in the future, when I've commercialized this invention, I think it's really going to change the way news gathering is done. You know how you have City Pulse everywhere and all that? I think it'll be really interesting to have uh, the City Pulse with the eyeglasses and 
you know, you get your own self-reference and everything. So I'll be, I'll be doing this uh, fashion show thing too on the Saturday night. And my students, I've got uh, 14 students who will be participating showing the historical a aspect of this invention. So they'll be showing the, the last 20 years of cyber fashion, which is sort of an, a misunderstood movement that started in Toronto in the summer of 85, because it was around that time that this really picked up and I sort of had a following in the, in the underground arts community and so on that picked up on this. So I want to sort of, we'll take us back to the summer of 85 here in Toronto where it all started. And now, of course, as this has expanded, um, uh, various other p uh, fa fashion designers from around the world have picked up on this trend and everything. So I think that'll be a chance to sort of look back and also look into the future of what we've got in store. So we'll have some special, interesting future pieces to show then on Saturday night. So I guess that's it. Is it